and welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, once again, I'm back with Dr. Amon, the Greek, the Greek whiz, the the PhD classicist over here, who's going to correct me on all the Greek stuff I get wrong. And of course, the up and coming on the rise, Ariel, who knows a little bit of Hebrew. And uh, yeah, we're just going to. Oh, yeah. So this is the whole point of my title. You guys are probably like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Apocalypse and, and uh, riddles, right? What, 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 are you, what are you going with this? So Amon has been looking into this ancient riddle. Um, where is it from, Amon? So this is the sibling oracles, number one. Um, yeah, there's a little numeric riddle that um, hasn't been answered as far as as far as anybody can tell, um, yeah. So um, we, we, looks, we cracked yeah. it. We cracked it. Yeah. Well, first, before we tell them how we cracked it and, and what, what 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 it actually is, and the and by the way, you're probably like, how is this going to spark the conflict? It's a joke. I'm on totally. If I figure this out, it's gonna it's gonna trigger the apocalypse because no one's ever figured it out before. <laughs> so I had to make that the title. But this is pretty interesting, though. You're gonna you're, it, 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 it. We're going somewhere, but this isn't just like crap this is like this is interesting stuff you're gonna like this it's, so it's let me let me just specify it's the yeah. riddle for a name the answer is the name of the creator the one who is being and knowing the name and being able to bring it into this plane will initiate the apocalypse wow so let's let's get it let's get it. let's read this riddle let's read this riddle so um do you want to read it anyone Want to read it? I'll go. Okay. Um, you, how, how far you want me to read? Just read this whole page. All right. Down under the foundation of the earth, and later yet another race much worse, of men he made to whom no good thereafter, the immortal formed since they wrought many evil, for they were much more violent than those giants perverse, foul language pouring out, single among all men, most most just and true, was the most faithful Noah, full of care for noblest works. And to him, God himself from heaven thus spoke, Noah, be of good cheer in thyself. And to all the people preach repentance so that they may all be saved. Wow. All right. Now, here, so here this is where the riddle starts, right, Amon? Oh, I, I muted you by accident. My bad. You can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Amon, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, get it, get it together, old man. <laughs> and and I am He who is, and in thy heart do thou discern. I clothe me with heaven, and cast the sea around me. And for me, earth is a footstool, and the air is poured around my body. And on every side around me runs the chorus of the stars. Do thou discern? Uh, whoops, nine. Uh, we'll start at one seventy-five. Um, here we go. Around me runs the chorus of stars. Yes. Oh, I'm yes, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Nine let. Okay. Here's where it starts. Not Nine. here's the here's the riddle, people. All right, all Nine right. letters have I of four syllables. I am discern me. The first three have each two letters. The remaining one, the rest, and five are mates. And of the entire sum, the hundreds are twice eight, and thrice three tens along with seven. Now, knowing who I am, be thou not uninitiated in my lore. Damn. So that that, like some, this is some, so this sounds like some real mystery religion. This is not just regular Judaism from Jerusalem temple priests. Like this is some like Platonist, uh, universalist, whatever, synchronism. There's a lot of, uh, oh, oh, I just got a really bad echo right there. Anyways, um, it's gone now. Okay, that was probably uh that was Nyx. That was the goddess Nyx tell, telling us to hurry up and get to the point. But anyways, uh, so the riddle, this riddle is like it has it's gematria, right? The gema it's it's all about gematria. So you're you're trying to find. It says there's nine letters and four syllables. So you you're really limited on this, and there has to be four vowels and five consonants, one after another. So it has to start with the consonant. And then it has to go constant, constant vowel, constant vowel, back and forth. So when you when you told me that, 
And you said, I think you said there was like no one that's ever figured this out. I I think there probably was. I don't. Maybe there's a note. There's an there's a note at the bottom of that passage, um, up to the point that that was published. That translation. He said we've worked on it. Yeah, there you get the beginning of it. Um, and we we got to 1696, but that's probably because the text is off. Right. It's off see, see that, that's so that's where I look. I was starting with. Let's go with the Gematrius, right? So this is what I did first. And tell, and just make sure you tell them like how this went down. I pulled this word. So hip, hip, hip or hip systos means, um, what does it mean again? It means, uh, like all like the, the, the highest, most high, right? You're, you're muted again. Correct. Hoopsistas with an Ada is the highest. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, ty I typed that word in and I, the Gematria was off. So I go, okay, it can't be that word. But then I changed out. I think I just added a theta. So if you see, it says hypsestros. And then I called you, and I was like, "Hey, I think I got it. It's it's 1697." And I go, "I go, it's the uh, it's most high." And you you looked at it and you go, "That's not how you spell it. That's not even a word." And I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> so I didn't have it. But it, but what I did have is I had something to start with. I had a gematria. I so. This word, if this was a real word, this this would pass the riddle in the sense that it has the right amount of vowels. Hip says throws. <laughs> hip says wait, hip says hip says throws. Yeah, your problem, your problem oh, was the ada still, on the front. It yeah, still would fail. Even because yeah. it doesn't even have the four uh, syllables. Yeah. But I had the right gematria. So what I did was I took away the O, the omicron, and I took away the iota and i added another i added a eta and an alpha and then i and then i then i called you up and you helped me put this together oh, i'm sorry an eta not an alpha and you were yeah, like and that and that pseudo -xune, this one that one was one that um so neil put this together he was like look you can do the numbers you can crunch the numbers on it this is i was yeah i was doing it so, all man. so let's just crunch the numbers so after a couple of iterations of this thing, this one was one um, we're trying to shuffle. We're tr at this point, we're trying to shuffle the words around, the letters around to maintain ourselves within the parameters of the riddle, yet to have the correct uh, meaning. What is the meaning? So this was Pseudo Ksune, and it was a little bit after this that I realized, oh, it's not Ksune, it's Nukse. Right, it's hey. The final eight on the end is the definite article. This is hey pseudonyx. Right. Who who is the? Um, how, tell them how you translate pseudonyx, uh, Neil. So pseudo nix. So the goddess nix is the goddess of night. Pseudo nixa means the image that um, pseudo nixa. If you throw a pseudo, well, tell them what that means when you throw a pseudo in front of a god's name. Yeah, it, it makes it what most of us would translate as false. Um, or in the Greek, the reflected image of something. Right. The, the non-reality that is being. So um, if you put the hey as the article, hey, pseudonyx, it's the imaged night. It's the imaged night. And you'll notice in our translation, it said the it used the pronoun he. The pronoun he is not in the text. So yeah. it's, it's not in the Greek text. So, um, yeah. So, hey, pseudonyx, the false knight or the imaged knight. And we have um, uh, this imaged knight as the invisible androgynous um, god that they call Phanes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, check yeah. this out, though. The reason why this fits so well because, I mean, check out what the riddle says. Earth is my footstool. The air is poured around my body. On every side around me is the chorus of the stars. What What else? Think about, because the, the way Greek gods are, Greek gods in the ancient world are not, they're not really, like, literally gods that are flying around in the sky. The Greeks had a way of describing what a phenomena is. So the goddess of night represents the phenomena of what night is, feels like. You see stars in the sky. So right away when when we when we uh, got pseudo Nixa, we we're like, dude, this is it. We fucking we cracked it. Like, the, what else? What else could that mean other than 
what this says. Earth is my footstool, air is poured around me on every side and runs the chorus of the stars. I yeah. clothe me, and then it says, I clothe me with the heaven and cast the sea around me for the earth is a footstool and the air. Like that to me, is that's night. That's nix. That's, there's no, I, I, I can't think of any other way we can, I think we cracked it. I, I might be reading something into it, but um, the, just the way that it describes it, like, um, so, you know, the earth is a footstool, that there's air surrounding it. Um, then it talks about waters and naturally next thing, um, probably somewhere it talks about fire. But um, I was reading something for my Roman religion class about um, Sibylle or Kybele, you know, depending on how you pronounce it, but where it talks about like the earth is being the source of all matter. And so like um, essentially that like the, um, the air that surrounds the earth because er the earth cannot be like, you, you know, the earth cannot be on earth. The earth has to be surrounded by air. Like um, I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but basically that they had this like idea that like the earth as almost like an entity, but like both yeah. as a concept, but also as like an entity is surrounded and clothed by all these things. And also like, I, I think there's also some references to, um, I'm blanking exactly what it is, but um, the something like the woman with the stars, um, I'm, I'm blanking, the, like the star revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Revelation, you have the woman who's clothed with the sun with uh, she's standing on the moon and she has a crown of 12 stars and the sibling oracles talks about that goddess too. Who is the mother who, okay. So later, later theologians in the Christian church say it's Mary, but there's other people, there's commentaries that say it's Venus. So early on, these early Christians are like all over the place. And That's Neil why. and Neil hold on Venus. What, it, what do they call Nix in the Orphic hymns? What do they call her? They call her Aphrodite. Really? She yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the deal with Aphrodite? Um, what's the deal? She's Urania. Um, she's the, you'll notice Urania, right? From Uranos. She is the female Urania. They worship her on Cyprus, right? Yeah. yeah it's where the Jewish race started out, <laughs> according to Tacitus. Yeah, I, wanna, so, I actually have that verse. Yeah, I want to get to that in a second. I also, but real quick, I want to mention how Nix, how important Nix is, because we people don't realize Nix is one of the primordial gods. By primordial gods, I mean the first generation is older than Dionysus, and all. there is so according to Hesiod, there was chaos, and that was all there was, and then leaping out of chaos, you have Nix and Eros. Is that how it goes, Amon? Yeah, yeah. So Nyx, Nyx is so important because she's one of the she's one of the like highest gods there is. So when, going back to that, uh, going back to the riddle, I, I went straight to Hypsis, Hypsistos, how you however you say it, because I thought this is obviously the Most High, and this is a this is the Sibylline Oracles. They're Jewish, and they only believe in one God. But then I started to think about this. The Sibylline Oracles is not monotheistic at all. There's no, it's just not, it's just, there's, there's so much stuff in there. There, especially like a lot of Platonism stuff, a lot of, you know, uh, Orphic stuff. I would and say, don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't don't forget. Pagan, no, I wouldn't call it pagan. But don't, I would say forget, it's don't forget the oldest is the Babylonian Sybil. And there's also a Jewish Sybil, right? right? And there's a Sybil, there's Sybils in Italy. There's Sybil, Sybils in Greece. Now, which one is this? So yeah. Which one is this? Good can you, can you answer that for me, Neil? I, that's why I'm asking. We said last time who this is. It's the one who's the daughter of Noah. Oh, that's who that, okay. That's who it's claimed to have written. That's who they say wrote, wrote this. That, so this is that's who the, who the composer of this song is saying right. is writing it. Right. That's who it is. So it, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm? That's very interesting. Oh, now, why? I have something I was going to say about Noah's daughters. There is okay, so that Noah's daughters, there's four of them, right? Or is it three of them? Three of them, and three. it's three oh, daughters, wow. three sons, and two. It's he and his wife. That's why he's the eighth man. Don't you follow right. the that's cult? what I was that's what I was getting to. There's eight people that's that leave the ark. 
there's also eight primordial gods. Yeah. Oh, also, another thing. What, um, why is the reason that Ham is cursed? Why is that? I can't remember. So it's because different oh, interpretations. He sees, he sees his father Noah naked, right? So that's that's, so that, that, that's like the most common understanding. But if you look deeper, there's actually an understanding that he um, he essentially castrated his father so that he couldn't bear any more children. Really? Where where is that in the actual? Is that in the Torah or is that? Um, I I think it's, it's a. Here. I think it's an interpretation of it because like at the end of the day, why would simply seeing your father naked, why, why would that be enough to be cursed? So one, one interpretation is that he actually like abused his father. The other is that he, well, I mean, I guess technically castration is a form of abuse. So yeah, it's, that, that's one of those passages that I just look at and I don't understand. It's so strange, but it's, it's also interesting because think about it. Noah has three sons. Who else has three sons? Saturn. Yeah, and not only that, but the daughter of Noah is like the muse. She, right. she she's essentially filling the place of um, of Aphrodite, and Aphrodite is born from the um in, you know from the castrated um uh, testicles of um Uranus that fall into the ocean. Yeah, and so Nyx being one of these primordial goddesses and. The, the the author of the Sybil is claimed to be one of the primordial women, I guess you would say. I don't know how you phrase that. Maybe this is her, because she is writing it as if it is her. She said, this is my name. I have nine letters, four syllables. Find out who I am. But you're like, wait a minute. I'm already reading, according to Amon, I already just, you already, I already know who you are. You told me you're one of Noah's daughters. But so is this one of those as above, so below things? I don't know. Maybe that's what it is, which which brings me to this, this next point is like, I actually, this is my, my current theory. I think that the Old Testament patriarchs are anthrop or um, you hammerize gods. So I think you have Aranos, you have Saturn, you have Jupiter, you have Dionysus. And I think when you look at the Old Testament, especially the Torah, specifically the first five books you see a lot of commonality of like the myths of hesiod or homer not even maybe more more of hesiod than homer but that's what i'm getting at like the only the, the offering up has only begotten something like sanko niathan talking about how saturn gave up his only son jude to aranos in heaven and then you're so now you now i'm looking at this riddle and I, now we forget about these goddesses noah and his and his seven uh, siblings and 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 wife, they they could they could easily represent the eight primordial gods from Hesiod, and Nyx is one of the three daughters. Maybe she's one of the goddesses. Who will the other two be? He's a prophesied eighth man, right? Peter yeah. knows. Peter knows that, and Jude knows it, and they're writing about. Peter writes about the preacher of righteousness. That's a Greek title. That you can find if you go back in Peter or if you go back to the Septuagint. I was just working with the Doctor of Divinity student on that um, very topic. That's what his research is covering right now. So, right. yeah. So, um, is there an association? Yeah. And um, this cult, that's the cult of the one who is the being, right? From Cyprus, that's the cult of Black Knight, they call her. Black Knight. So when you have Noah's daughter being the Sybil, it only makes perfect sense because remember that princess of that preacher of righteousness, that princess is the one who is the high priestess, right? Yeah. The, the, the Egyptians do it. The Cretans do it. It's just it's the way it goes, right? So, yeah, um, yeah she is acting as the knight from, no. from the well, chaos, right? According, according to Hesiod, I think it is. It's one of the sources. She's called Phanes. I looked into I looked into who Phanes is. Phanes is a hermaphroditic god, as you can see, and she look he and and they I should say and they um appear to be have wings, have a serpent wrapped around them, holding a thunderbolt that or having some sort some sort of crown, standing on the moon. It seems like which is weirdly similar to the passage in Revelation. But it also looks a lot like Mithra. And then I found out that Mithra was called Thanes too. 
What's going on with that? Also, so, yeah. another thing that's worth mentioning: what, what, what is um, in that um, in that relief? What is that figure being surrounded by, or you know, coiled around by? The zodiac. And now check this out. No, no, no. no. What I'm talking about, like, if you look at his actual body, I said the snake already. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I missed that. Oh, no, you're good, you're good. Um, yeah, so, not- another thing that's worth noting, just because you brought up the concept of like princess or whatever, that that actually is the direct translation of the name Sara. Sara means princess. Yeah, and so when you look at the Mithra nice. image, that yeah, that is pretty. That's pretty dope. When you look at the Mithra image, he's standing on what looks like sort of sort of planet, holding sort of similar thing. He's got wings. He's got the snake coiled around him. And he's called, look at, you see on the bottom of the thing, Mithric Lion, also called Fanies. Yeah, and that's but, not just the globe, Neil. That's the Chaldean Spiron, the erotic Spiron, they call it. They refer to it as a pl- as a toy with which Eros plays. The, the Hecatic magic comes through that Spiron. And you'll notice that it's quartered. That's because that's what we do is we quarter the universe, right? Yeah. Ask, ask any, ask that's any great. magician, right? Um, Cause that's how all the magic works. So congratulations, Neil, you found Lucifer's anus. And when that's I say, anus, what it is. when I say it is. anus, I'm using a Latin term that comes back to us through the Etruscan. And it means his female masculine support. His, it's sometimes translated maid servant, and the gorgo. Do you know the gorgo? The gorgo is an anus. The really? gorgo is an anus. So the so she you has, said she oh. has both. They said in the Middle Ages you need to kiss the anus of <laughs> of Lucifer. Oh, right? because wow. she she is the one who has the communion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, okay, so let me just, I, I want to, because I'm getting somewhere with this. If you're a mythicist and you're watching this, I'm about to show you something's going to blow your mind. Because it, it almost made me go, wait a second. Here. What's this going on? So I'm looking into this whole, oh, go ahead, Ariel. You something to say? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, before we do, is that also, be, because I I don't know the full context, but that, like, one of the things, one of the polemics that was used against the Templars was something about, like, the, their underwear, like there's some concept with like the anus as well, but like that that it was connected with some like devil worship or something. Yeah, yeah. When they were tried, when they were tried, it came out that they had uh, were known to have a purple stripe in the anal region of their undergarments, and it was known that the or they were accused of this that the younger initiates. <laughs> That the younger initiates were required to either kiss their penis or to lick their anus. All right, and, hold on. Let's 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 move on from that. Let's oh, just, okay, okay. Fanies, right. oh, oh, Fanies. All right, the king of the universe. This is this is according to Theo.com. I don't know how. I want to see if anyone. I, 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 Amo, let me know if you think this is uh this is bullcrap or not. But it says. Thanes was the first king of the universe who handed the royal scepter over to his daughter, Nyx, who in turn handed it down to her son, Aranos. Now, this is not what Hesiod's telling us. This is something else. Do you know where this is some other myth? What is this can, coming from? Can father and daughter be the same? Can, can, can Athena spring from the mind of Zeus and the new power that rules is the power of Metis. Is that what it says over? Okay, so yeah, that, that's the next thing. Phanels is also echoes the figure of Metis, the goddess devoured by Zeus, Tethys, nurse of all. Phanels' golden winged, hermaphroditic deity wrapped in coils of a serpent. Okay. And oh, his name means bring to light. Is that what that name, Phanes means light? I, I thought it meant like manifestation. Like for instance, Epiphanes meant, means like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also uh, another thing, uh, because Amon, one of the words you used to describe, I, I forget the exact context, but something like maid servant. Well, because, is, that, is that what that means though, Amon? Fanes? Is that what it means light? I just want to get to that. I just want to get that across real quick. Fanes means the visible. It comes from fino, okay. meaning to appear. So it something. is related to light then. 
something it is to, he's the one invisible uh protagonist he doesn't you can't see him but he's there and his name means to be visible damn man this is this is blowing my mind i don't know about you guys this is blowing my mind right now and you asked hang on don't forget zeus and athena because you asked about the father-daughter combination this is a type we see over and over again and it turns out it's the within the orphic context it's the daughter who springs from the father who is that mystery she is that power of the universe that everything that is being has given consciousness to yeah so i was looking into like the like where where this the locations of where these ideas were um like really put forth not just like red not just hesiod but it's the island of crete is where this is all, these ideas are big turns out that crete and not only crete ida where where we, where we left off in the last time we went live we we're talking about where tacitus says that the jews are from crete this is what he says he says some say that the jews are fugitives from the island of crete who settled on the nearest coast of africa about the time when saturn was driven away driven from his throne by the power of jupiter evidence of this is sought in the name there is a famous mountain in crete called ida the neighboring tribe the idea came to be called judea by a barbarous lengthening of the national name Others assert that in the reign of Isis, the overflowing population of Egypt, led by Hero Shlemus and Judas, discharged itself into the neighboring countries. Oh so, wow! A lot of a lot of scholars say that that's not correct. But Amo, what do you think? Uh, I don't know, Ariel. You feel Creighton? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't feel not Creighton, but <laughs> um, <laughs> now here's the thing, though. Here's the thing about that. It is interesting that, like the okay, so when you look at the Israelites, they obviously have Semitic language, which means they're coming from the the Fertile Crescent region, like their culture and their ideas are coming from over there. But also, you have to look at when you when you take a look at Egypt, the the eighteenth, seventeenth, sixteenth dynasties of Egypt, their their borders their borders go all the way up to. Uh, up to the Hittites, so they all of Canaan was part of Egypt for a while. So you got to realize, and then there's obviously there's the Sea Peoples invasion after the uh, the collapse of the Bronze Age, and you have people coming from the north going into Egypt, and all of a sudden there's just like big melting pot there. But what I'm getting at is, um, I almost wonder if some of these Hyksos people, I'm not saying the Hyksos are Israel, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is some of these Hyksos people. So have their culture end up living in Canaan and then generations go by, generations go by and centuries go by and they allegorize history. So I'm not saying that the Hyksos explosion is the Exodus, but what I think might have happened was when the Exodus story is getting written, they're allegorizing the, the past and the Hyksos explosion is, is like one of those things that they're allegorizing. What do you guys think about that? I, I tend to think that's a really good theory. Um, like in terms of w what you brought up, how Egypt used to control, you know, what, it, um, what, what was, you know, the land of Canaan or Israel that essentially we, we tend to view it like the Exodus from, you know, Egypt, that it's the Israelites leaving Egypt, but maybe it's actually Egypt leaving Israel. And that this like um, pulling away is what allows for a development of culture in a way that's not completely, you know, domineered over by Egyptian culture and it has more influence from like Assyria and uh, from the Hittites and from uh, Mesopotamia, whereas like previously a lot of their influence was primarily coming from Egypt and presumably also the rest of the Mediterranean. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at this map right here. This is the Egypt's dominions during Ramses. So it's not crazy to think that a lot of these ideas are, you know, getting spread around. And so what I think happened was, like you just said, it's not that there was an exodus and the Red Sea was split, but it's that when they lost dominion over these lands and they later got allegorized in myth, they they take that story and say, okay, we, we got our independence. But really, it's just they, like you said, it's the exact opposite, actually. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of Egypt losing its dominion over Canaan. 
Canaan becoming its own individual state and then becoming the Israelites and then, you know, allegorizing their history into a myth and the Red Sea, obviously. Because I don't even think, honestly, my opinion is I don't even think Moses existed. I think he's based off, I think he might be a collection. I, I think he might be um, like a few people, like they might have taken people from history. And he's sort of a um, sort of a composite character based off two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five people all added into one person. What do you think about that, Ariel? What do you think about that? I know you're. this is a big deal for you. What do you think about that? So, I mean, like, at the end of the day, it's definitely possible, but, like, there are accounts of – and so, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it kind of goes down to, like, what Moses are we talking about? Because, like, for instance, I think it's Manitho that um, has an account of, like, a rogue Egyptian priest leading a bunch of uh, leper slaves in a revolt yeah. against Egypt. And so it's like, if that was something that actually happened – like at the end of the day, just because there might be influence from other places as well, like who's to say that there wasn't like a historical Moses, wh whether like that person was actually named Moses or like whether or not all the stories were attributed to him, I'm not sure. But I mean, th there, there does seem to be a lot of um, like at least stories from other people, not just from the Israelites that tell about Moses, whether yeah. in a positive or a negative light that, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really have a position either way, but yeah. when, one thing, though, I wanted to touch on before we get too far from it. So one of the words um, that Amon used to describe, I forget exactly what the context was, but was like maidservant. Do you remember that? So Honest. Honest. Yeah, honest. So the reason why that really stuck with me, because um, so I, um, I've i been really interested in looking at like, where does this idea of like the demiurge in, you know, Jewish Gnosticism come from? And I really think that it has to do with this like... Um, this interpretation of the word, which in Hebrew, like it, it, it's spelled Amon, but it gets translated as um, either like Demiurge or like craftsman. But apparently one of the translations it gets interpreted into is almost like a nanny or a, like a maidservant, someone who watches over. Nice. Nice. It's, it's, yeah, that looks like it's probably residue within the language of what that original root was meaning. Cause you get this um, figure and you get her from the Etruscan side um, on for the Romans. That's how she filters into the Roman um, religion. And, uh, and oh, and the Pocula. Before I forget, the Pocula, I sent Neil that note. Um, the Pocula, or, or the Pocula, is the Etruscan drink, the holy cup. And you refer to Ganymede's anus as his Pocula, right? His Poculum, right? Yeah. So... Father and daughter, father and daughter, are they are are they there? Yeah, um, yeah. So um, uh, let me let me read this as we're thinking about Ariel's answer to. Yeah, well, I wanted I wanted to bring up. Wait, 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 let me hang, hang on. Let me get Neil if I if 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 you don't yeah, mind. Go ahead. go ahead. Goddess of dark, quiet, and fightful one. Oh, you who have your meal amid the graves, night. Darkness, broad chaos, necessity, hard to escape are you. Your Moira and Aranus. Torment, justice, and destroyer. You know what destroyer is? Destroyer is Percy. Yeah. And wow. you keep Cerberus in chains. What? This is the creator? That fanic creator we're talking about? Yeah. You keep Cerberus in chains with scales of serpents. Are you dark? This is Black Knight. That's why they call her Black Knight. Yeah. With scales of serpents, are you dark? Oh, you with hair of serpents, serpent girder, girded, who drink blood. I told you she was a vampire, but she didn't believe me, Neil. Yeah. Right? Right? And you just opened up her name, right, for this to initiate the Aryan ap apocalypse. Good job. Well, I here's where here's where it gets crazy. I, sure. I'm leading up to something here. Go because ahead. when I looked into where these – what location all this was going was going down at? Who was who was actually like using this mythology in their secret sacred rites? And it's Crete, it's Ida, it's the Ideans in Crete. And I was like, what? And then I remember because I, if you guys didn't, if you guys don't know the course that Litwa put out. I sold the course, or I mean, Litwa made a course, and I'm selling it on the channel. It's a, there's a link in the description for it. In part six, or I think it's five or six where he gets into the, the Samothrakian mysteries. Oh, it's number one, actually. Sorry. The Samothrakian mysteries and, the, and then the fifth part where there's Addis mysteries with Kybele. So you had these, these islands of Greek 
in the ancient ancient Greece, going back before the Persian Empire, they have these initiation or they have these uh this mythology of Kybele, and then there's another god who's Saba Zeus, and there's like a hand, and his hand represents the dactyls. The hand, right? Amo, is that straight? Is that what it is? His hand represents these dactyls. And there's five of these dactyls. Dactyl is a finger. Dactyl is a finger. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And check this yeah. out. This is where it gets crazy. So one of the gods is a is an equivalent of Addis. And his name, can you guys see that? Let me see if I can make this bigger. His name is Isios. Oh no, Yasios or Yasion. Now, if I was a mythicist, I'd be all over this shit. Now, I, I think it might be a coincidence, to be honest, because I think there was a guy named Jesus. But if you're a mythicist right now, you should be like, dude, I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. There's, I knew it the whole time. There literally is a god whose name is Yasios. And he, it actually kind of means like healer or something, too. And he's thought the to Greek, be the Greek yaomai, the Greek verb yaomai means to heal or to aid or assist. Yeah. And the word iatros is a doctor. There's an older one called iatrina. And people think it's just the feminized version of the male, but it's not. It's its own. When you female, look female witch doctor, um, Mycenaean stuff. Yeah, good stuff. So yeah. Well, and just... and in magic, in magic, you use the three vowels, Yoda, Alpha, and Omega, because they are what start the incantation. You like that? Yeah, yeah. And what's even crazier, though, is he's equated with Addis, the dying consort with the Phrygian goddess Kai Sibylle. And it, it's what's even crazier about this whole thing is part of the same location, they have a god named Cosmos, who's also called Adama. He's oh the, wow! He's the primordial man. And are, so, are you thinking, go ahead. Yeah. Speak. So, so obviously you have this possible connection between Cosmos and Cadmus, but at least from a Semitic perspective, Cosmos um, might be connected to the idea of Cadmon from the root Kedem, which means like from the east, but literally like it, it means like from the beginning or from antiquity. So like uh, Kedem refers to like times of old. So, um, so like there's this idea of like, like so for instance, the um, like the primordial Adam literally in Hebrew is Adam had Adam HaKadmon. Right. So I, I even Litwa said there's probably a connection between Adam and this God, Adama. But we don't I don't think that one borrowed from the other. What's more likely is they both came from a, an ancient source. There's another source that they're both getting this from. And because another thing is, they, some people think that Hades, Hades, might have some connection with Adam. Adam and Eve, there's, there's, they're, they're, it's, it's very possible that Adam and Eve are connected with Hades and Persephone. Like, like I mentioned before, Persephone called, has called Ewa, which is the Bacchic chant. And she bites the pomegranate and gets stuck in hell. Whereas Eve is in heaven. She bites the apple or the, you know, the fruit. And she gets kicked out of heaven. So they're both taking a bite of the of what represents wisdom, heavenly divine wisdom. And they both get either trapped in hell or kicked out of heaven. So you, get, you see that connection there too. And so when I saw this, when I saw this, that there's a y Yasios. And he is a perhaps equivalent to Addis. And so when I and I had to look into it, I gotta see this is is this bullshit or not? And there's not a so what I found was this: there's not a lot about there's not a lot written about him that that, that survived. Most of the stuff about Yasios are gone, deleted, not deleted, but just not not handed down. And so the only stuff we have is from like Hesiod, and he's an agricultural deity. He's a corn god, and his consort is Demeter. So what that what I, what I right just what stuck out to me right away is the fact that in ancient Sumer, Inanna and uh, and da Damutsi are both agricultural deities, and just like Tammuz, you have this Yasios deity who gets uh, he gets struck down by Zeus and brought down to Hades and then brought back up again 
by Demeter. And he's responsible for the growing of crops, just like Tammuz is. So he's a he's an agricultural dying and rising deity, just like Addis, just like Eshmon, whose name means oil, and just like all these other dying and rising agricultural deities. Now, the fact that his name is so close, I gotta find like I personally I don't want to like jump to conclusions yet, but like I'm surprised no one ever talks about this. That's all I'm saying. He's I'm not you. Expert, I'm He's just... you, Neil. He's you, right? You you are Addis, right? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You no, I'm serious. In the death experience, right? right? In the death and resurrection, you become Addis. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, is that... that you're tracing the history and you're saying, look, these other people had it and they're doing it. They had the same images, the same power. All of the magic is around the image. So what is that image bringing forward to us, right? That it, you don't have the Addis without the Addis, without Black Knight, right? The font, the Fanes, the invisible. Yeah. So, so, right. so is that the Vril? Is that the Vril that we were talking about in the 19th century? Is that why he's so obsessed that that guy who was on the Privy Council of Queen Victoria, is that why he was so obsessed? Um, with the Aryan roots and the real, yes, it's one right. It's an Aryan right. Yeah. So yeah, fantastic. And, and, and so with with if we take this over to El Eleusis, right, mm -hmm. where the mysteries are very similar, the mythology is very similar. We have we have Demeter, but now we have Bacchus. You know what I mean? It's a little bit more. It's a little newer than this. Sam, Sam with Rakin's way. I think it's a lot more ancient. No, they're both ancient. But anyways, by the time we get to the Roman illusion and the mysteries, you have this idea of Demeter and you have Bacchus. You have the vine and you have the grain, right? Just like that we have in the uh, Eucharist. Here's my blood, here's my blood, here's my body. But with uh with this with these mysteries, now Kyle Ruck has done so much work on this. And what I think that he gave us that is just precious and priceless is that the fact that we have initiates who say that when they when they went to the to the right during the winter or se or summer solstice, whenever whenever it was open for the for the initiate initiatory uh, rites, they would take the kaikion, they would take the kaikion, and they would have an experience, and they no longer fear death. And so they whatever, all whatever. said, and wait, and they all said, they all said, Cicero among them, you are able to view the resur. What they were viewing is the resurrected. Cora, whose name we don't pronounce. Those of us who have been initiated, no, we don't pronounce it because we know what power that has. Oh, what's we that are making, like? We are making visible the invisible. Wow. That, that, that sounds just like the concept that later becomes, you know, institutional in Judaism that it basically um, the religious Jews end up replacing um, their use of the name of God with literally the word, the name Hashem. And like that, that's due to the power. Well, on one hand, due to the fact that the true pronunciation was lost and that was seen as on purpose, but on the other hand, so that people can refer to the name without directly invoking the power. Also another um, parallel I, I'm seeing between, you know, this, um, um, you know, you know um, essentially like these parallels um, so apparently with Mount Ida, there was this idea of the twin mountains. There was Mount Ida in Crete and Mount Ida in Anatolia. And that also parallels this idea of the twin mountains in Judaism, like uh, the uh, the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Curse. Or you could look at it as, you know, Mount Zion and Mount um, Sinai, like that, that there's this tradition of two mountains, depending well, on. No, it's, Hor it's Horeb and Sinai. Because Zion is just another way to say uh, Sinai, but it's Horeb. Horeb is in the north, Sinai in the south. So well, yeah, no, that's a good point though. That, that well, that's a thing. Well, no. So there, the, so no. So, um, so Mount Sinai that refers to the desert of Sinai, but then Zion is a whole different route. It's actually, um, it's a. I'd argue it's like a declination or a like a corruption of Saphon, because um, right, either, of either either way you have that in the south and you have Horeb in the north is what I'm saying. 
Yeah, but I mean, like, depending on the tradition, it could be Horeb, it could also be Tzafon. Like, the, just this idea of a northern and a southern mountain. That's what, yeah, that's what I was saying. That's what, yeah. So yeah. what's with the, so Moses and the gang and all the Bacchants and um, those who were reaching this level of uh, mystery initiation where the God is brought into a form that can communicate with people, whether it's in Moses' tent you know, yeah. above the uh, above the cherubim, where and they got a jar of manna sitting there, right? Or that, whether that is, or whether it's the oracle, or what? Yeah, or whether it's the oracle, right? Um, yeah, um, manna, by the way, is a type of incense. In oh, Greek. That, I'm in, so in, glad. In, you anyway, anyway, <laughs> wait, wait. I'm it, so glad you brought this up. Why do you have the? Why do you have the? Um, what are the snakes doing there? Always the dudes with the poles and the snakes and the. And, and all this uh, and all the viper stuff i mean they're even putting it in their hair and they're putting it on their arrows and they're doing it looks like this kind of yeah nice why do they call the orphics those of the serpent with it within the breast right you right. eudosha put that eudosha up there sometime we'll check um, that, but check anyway that. go ahead go ahead i'll the show why, the, no you're fine the reason why i'm glad you brought this up because um the uh oh what was i gonna say again the the right okay so taking the 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 idea of a levite who's only the only the levites are allowed to go into this holy of holies no one else is allowed to go in the holy of holies in fact when poppy the great sacked the temple they made a big deal that he went inside the holy of holies they're like if you go in there yahweh's gonna smote you and he went in there and he survived <laughs> well anyways that's not that's a whole other topic because you know what does that tell you but anyways the idea of only an ordained Levite priest can go into the Holy of Holies, and they are the only ones who can get a revelation straight from God to them, right? Now, here we go. Here we have a story from a Christian. This is like in the Nag Hammadi or something. This is on a Christian text where uh, it's a it's an extended version of the story of Luke with Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, goes into the temple. This ties back into the whole Hexos thing. Wait, wait till you hear this. So he uh, he goes into the temple, and he does his thing, burns the incense, the manna, the, all that stuff, and all of a sudden, a god appears right in front of him, and he has a head of a donkey, a golden donkey. And he leaves, and he's mute. He can't talk until the, John the Baptist is born. Now, come to find out, the Hyksos, who... Josephus and Manetho and Baracus and all those guys, they think that the Hyksos are the Israelites. Now we know it's not that simple. There's, you know, they're not exact, it's not exactly one equals one, but there's like something going on where people are tying the Hyksos into who are called the shepherd kings into the Israelites. They worship Set. Set is sometimes depicted with a donkey, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes he is. And so we even have a source from the first second century BCE from a man named Manasius who says that um, Manasius says that the uh, King Antiochus sacked the temple and found a golden donkey head. So what's up with this set thing, right now the golden bit. Now this, like I said, this ties into the whole, the whole history of the Jews thing, because is this the case now going back to what I was talking about with, uh, with Tacitus, when he says the Hyksos got kicked out of uh, Egypt, it was because of an oracle of Amon. Amon was seen as the highest god of all. He was Jupiter. He was Zeus. He's he's El. He's whoever you want the high god to be. He's the high god. He's the most high. But the Hyksos, as they get kicked out, they're worshiping Set, who is the enemy of this god. And so this leads Tacitus to say, that they're going to worship Saturn. He he thinks it's Saturn. I want to see you want to say something. I just wanted to say how beautiful it is what you're relating. Um, yeah, um, they refused the Saturnian the, to bend the knee to the Saturnian power. And yeah, if um hide that row and you've got Satan. Baudelaire came up with that. Well, that's interesting because the Gnostics noticed this and Mark. I'm okay. I'm reading this right now. Actually, this is like my current read right now. It's Hippolytus' refutation of all heresies. 
Oh, Hippo- Hippolytus. Hippolytus. Hippo- sorry. Hippolytus, refutation of all heresies. Oh my God, when I tell you, you have to get this and read it. There's so many secrets in here about the early Christians. Hippolytus thought he was arguing that he was going to defeat all these early Christian heretics. But really what he did was he shed so much light on these who the real Orphic Christians were, the real ones, the ones that talk about um, how there is a, there's two gods, not one. And not, I'm not talking about Jesus and Yahweh. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Yahweh and another God who is the God of light and goodness. And they say that Yahweh is fire. They don't say evil, and they don't say that. No one's saying that. They're just saying he, they oppose each other. They're not, it's not like one's bad, the other one's good. There's a fiery God, and then there's another God who is like, you know, I don't know, he's just different. And so Jesus, according to these Gnostics, according to these Marcionites, Jesus wasn't the son of the fiery God. He was the son of a different God. So when he uh, curses the fig tree, he's saying that the fig tree, he's basically saying, like, you guys worship the devil. He even says that. Your father is the devil. That's what he says. So Hippolytus is like, no, 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 that's 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 heresy. There's only there's only one God, and it's it's and Yahweh is the son of that God. So he's he's against that idea. But I just think it's interesting that those ideas were being thrown around in there, and now we have access to them because of this. Yeah, and that's Neil. That's uh, without that valuable source, we wouldn't know as much as we do about the operation of the mystery cult in the first centuries BC and AD. It's it's a fantastic and it turns me on that you're doing that. I like that. That's that's beautiful. Is is it Hippolytus um, or is it Epiphanius? They both are writing on heresies, hieresis, heresies. Yeah. Is, is it him or is it um, Epiphanius who talks about the Ophites drinking semen? Is that did you have that in Hippolytus? That's in, that's in here. That's in here. Oh, so oh, oh, Irenaeus has that too. Irenaeus. So I was just going to say. Why do we always assume that this other god is a god and not a goddess? That's a good booyah, question. booyah, Ar- Ariel. Yes, best question no, ever. A- I'm going to shut up. Somebody from the gallery, somebody answered that question. Thank you. Well, Ask it again, Ariel. Well, because uh, you know, there's actually a text that says it is a goddess, and it's called the Revelation. It's a secret book of John. The secret book of John says that Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, was really the one who created the world, and it was her that formed Adam, and that Yaldabaoth, who represents the other fiery gods, the Marcionites call him, Yaldabaoth had a dream, and she made him think that it was him who was the creator, just to fool him, just to play, just to play with his head a little bit, and he has no idea that everything he's doing is is evil, and that she's really the good one, and she is the father of the logos. Who is called? And if we look at the Book of John, who is the Logos? That's Jesus. So you're not you, you, that question has does have an answer. It just depends on what source you look at. Oh wow! And so I'm actually um, I I think I shared a bit of this before, but I've been looking through some like rabbinical texts uh, like that mention the concept of the Shekhinah, which is I, I truly believe is like derived from this idea of or like basically that Sophia, the Holy Spirit, the Shekhinah, they, they're all derived from this like basic concept that there is like either a counterpart or a part of God that is feminine and that um, like, it's just so wild because it's stuff that doesn't really get talked about as much lately, but I'm going to try to find a relevant source to bring up that really like ties into this, but yeah. Hey, Ariel, Ariel, does um, Asherah have fit any of those uh, types or epithets for, um, can we call Asherah the a primordial um, or protagonist female? Can we can we do that or not? Is Asherah does she not fit that mold? I mean, so I can you maybe like rephrase that? Yeah, like um, are there any titles? Do they ever is does she ever have any titles where you can kind of draw a composite picture of her? So like, is she ever referred to as firstborn? Or is she ever referred to um, as a uh, as a pan mater or a great an all mother? Did they ever call? Yeah. Call so, so interestingly, there there is um, 
these a lot of references to almost all the references to Asherah in the Hebrew Bible are understood as like essentially referring to an Asherah pole, but there's a lot more hidden ones. So like, for instance, um, you have the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is like kind of like Sophia. Um, but then you have the tree of life, which after Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge, God takes away from um, like removes it from the garden or um, like, like removes it from their midst. And so um, the, the tree of life, it's Chaim, like there's this one understanding that, um, or maybe it's not understanding, but just because of how the names are connected. So Chava is essentially like a, mund a mundane or like a, like a non-deific form of the name Chaya, which, which is where like it's Chaim, the tree of life. So Chaya me literally means life. And, um, but Chava is... Like it's all, it's also life, but it's more so like a type of earthly life as opposed to like, just like, um, maybe like a metaphysical life. And so with this, you have, um, like all this stuff where it talks about she, and it, it never says Asherah directly, but like, um, in Proverbs here, let me pull this up. Um, it is like so striking. So it's Proverbs, um, it's because they got divorced, didn't it? Once they got divorced, then it was like, take her name off of everything. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, all, all, her, all her stuff belongs to me now. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, one second. Tree of Life. Um, in pro okay, here. Let me share my screen. Um, share screen. Uh, let's see. Is it working? Uh, one moment. Here. Oh, let's see it. All right. So, um, let's see. Where is it? Okay. Yeah. So right before this, it's talking about honor the Lord, like all this stuff about honor the Lord. And I'm guessing, yeah, it's referring here to Adonai or Yahweh. Um, but um, and it's also interesting because elsewhere, like in some rabbinical literature, it, it sometimes, depending on the context, it refers to when it says Elohim, that it is like referring to Yahweh working through the Shekhinah. And so like because of this concept of plurality in that context, that's why they're saying that it's using Elohim instead of, you know, yod Hey vav Hey. But, um, all right, so let's see. Uh, all right. Hap, so here does is... That mean, does, yeah. that mean, does that mean that I am, when they talk about, he says that I am, because um, that's the same, ex in Greek, it's the same expression they're using for Nyx, that she is the I am. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that. And even the, there's a similar pronunciation, like Ewa, ye Yewa, like it's so close. There's a super chat if you guys wanna. Oh yeah, that. yeah. All right. Um, and we, we could always obviously get back to this. I just want to uh, address it. Thank you for the super chat, Jim Markstein. What is the meaning of the gematria of eight 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 in Jesus Christ, or is it just a coincidence? And uh, turn Hep Hippolytus has a ver has a verse about this. I just pulled it up while I was looking for this while while I was uh while you were talking. And he has this crazy verse right here. And he says, because the early Christians were obsessed with Gematria, as you can see with Nero being 666, the Gnostic Basilides has uh, the logo of my channel, which is Abraxas, has a Gematria of 365, the planetary spheres and the sun and all that stuff, solar. But Jesus, this is what, this is what Hippolytus says. Why is Jesus called the Alpha? Jesus possesses the ineffable generation from the mother of the universe. And I mean the first tetrad. I'm just going to mute you guys just because it's a little bit of sort of noise, but don't worry. You can just come back as soon as you want to talk. I mean the first tetrad proceeded forth in the manner of a daughter. The second tetrad, and it became an agdoad from which proceeds. This is some Pythagorean shit right here from which proceeded from the Dikad, and thus was pr produced 10 and next 18. The decade, therefore, coming in with the Agdoad and referring it tenfold, produced the number 80. And again, making 80 tenfold, generated the number 800. And so that its entire number of letters that proceeded from the Agdoad into Dekad is 888 which is Jesus Christ, for the name Jesus, according to the number and letters, 
is 888. Now, likewise, the Greek alphabet has eight monads and eight decads and eight hectonads, and these exhibit the calculated sum of 888. I did not know this. That is, Jesus, who consists of all numbers. This is true. The mythicists are going to, they should be all over this shit. If that is Jesus who would consist of all numbers, and then on the, this account he is called Alpha and Omega, indicating his generation to be from all. Wait, 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 wait. Did I hear that right? That the full gematria of the whole Greek alphabet is 888? Is that true? We got to look this up. That doesn't sound right because... It doesn't sound right at all. Now, now you know why Neil the... And by the way, it's Isop... It's psiphos, meaning a pedal, and iso, a pebble. And iso, meaning equal, so it's an equal accounting, isopsophy. Um, gematria is, is uh, specifically the Semitic use of the isopsophy. It's an accounting of the letters and the numbers. So there is a difference. It's also impossible that what he said, because the, om the uh, omega itself is worth 800. Yeah, the, and the last letter, which they don't ever represent, is 900. So, 900. so it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. So, I, don't know what, now, I don't know what he was saying by that. But now you do know, Neil, now you do know why the Ogdoad is so important. Why that eighth man, well, why that eighth man is not just a, it's not just a, oh, is this number six, right? No, he is the eighth man. Oh, right. the, and the, the, it, there's also a representation, if you think about it, like within the um, the idea that, you know, um, I mean, this is more of a Semitic idea, but actually, I don't, it, I'm guessing there's probably some reflection within um, like Hellenic thought, but maybe in a different way. But the idea that the world was, you know, created in six days and on the seventh that God rested, but then this idea that on the eighth day that, you know, God will return to like remake the world. Yeah. I'm trying to fix this. Uh, okay, this is Ashmon, guys. Nice, Ariel. Ashmon. Ashmon. This is a god who is worshipped in Phoenicia. And his name connects him with oil. It's from encyclopedia.com. It's not. It's a really it's a decent source. His name connects him with oil. Um, in the Abla archives. Third millennium BCE. This is ancient, guys. This is ancient. The theophoric element Simuna is found in some personal names. The Sumerian meaning oil. Like, what is a Christ, guys? A Christ is to be oiled. So this is like literally like an ancient version of a Christ, of some sort of Christ. The one who oils. Now, here's where it gets crazy. He's the a Siddak, Siddak. Now, some there are some people, believe it or not. There was a there was a writer who thought that Siddak has connected to Melchizedek. It was a 19th century uh, scholar who thinks there's a connection between Siddic and Melchizedek. I don't know what other scholars think about that. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not an expert. But either way, either way, Ashmon is the eighth son. Is the eighth son of this god who's like a Jupiter. And he's not, he's a, he, like Bacchus, he's the son of a mortal woman, like Semele. So he's not a god. He's a demigod. And he he literally cuts off his, wait, what does this say? Contains the name of Eshbun, probably also of Astarte, where they texted the number. Oh, that's nothing. Never mind. But anyways, he castrates himself and dies. It's in here somewhere. Oh, man. Works. You mentioned the start, though. It starts not nothing. No, but... I'm, still, no, I'm, I'm getting on, to that. On, get, get it. Let me finish. He castrates himself and dies. And Astarte is in love with him. I'm trying to find where that is, but it's not. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and look for it all day. I'll just, I'll just explain it. A star is looking for him, or she's in love with him, and she resurrects him, brings him up into the heavens, and then he becomes the what uh, Damascius calls the Phoenician version of Asclepius. And he comes back down as a god, as a healer. So and that's, I, and that's who they worshipped on the island of, uh, on excuse me, on Cyprus. That's yes. who they worshipped is Aphrodite Urania with her lover that is resurrected. Now we just met. We just we just were looking at how this Yasios character from Samothrace is connected with Addis, but Ashmon, who's in Phoenicia, is exactly like Addis. He castrates himself and dies just like Addis does. 
So what's going on here? It's all I'm going to say. Now, that doesn't mean that they're to get to the whole thing of what are you, where are you going with this? Are you, are you mythicist now? No, there was a guy, but all the theology that we see that's in the New Testament, I think is coming from all these places. Influence, not, not borrowed or copied, influencing. You know what I'm saying? I think Christianity is in its own category, obviously. It's not the exact same thing. But when we look at this, it has an Orphic past. It's influ- There's so many people who pointed out that Christianity is like the marriage between Orphism and Judaism. I think that's a spot-on way to describe it. Do you think that, Amon? I think Judaism is the perfect marriage of Orphism and Arianism um, through the Medwa in Georgia. And I think um, you cannot mistake. What you're saying is 100% accurate. You cannot mistake the fact that the drawing down of the God for the sake of authority, power, revelation, prophecy is behind both religions. Judaism, Christianity. You can't deny that. Yeah, the um, you know, I would I would go so far as to say Judaism is a mystery and it should be classified as a mystery. And the uh the Alexandrian Jews living in, in the third century, second century, first century BCE during the Ptolemy era, they claimed Orpheus as one of their own. They said Orpheus is one of our he's he's a pi- he was a pious worshiper of the most high, El Elyon. That's what they're saying. They're claiming Orpheus as they, they call him Orpheus the Theologian. That's what his nickname was. It's in the Sybil. I have it over here. They call him Orpheus the Theologian. And I've seen them also declare Museus or Museus as Moses. So, yeah, there's definitely overlap. Yeah, definitely. definitely. It's also worth, worth mentioning that, um, like, when we started the stream, the, the one name that you originally thought, like, fit the riddle that uh, that means most high. That's literally what El Elyon means. It means the most high God. Yeah. Yeah, they're but, using oh, yeah. the same epithets. They're using the same uh, concepts, the same images. That's why I always go back and, you know, I wasn't joking before to the snakes. Why is everybody holding up a snake? Why are there vipers in the middle of this whole business? You know, where does that dragon come from that guards the tree? There's something. I think personally... I think, oh, look at him. I think, I think it's, uh, um, you can trace back the pharmacology. I think you can trace back the pharmacology and get all your answers. This, come on, guys. This is scientific, right? These are people living in the Bronze Age, right? Late Bronze Age. We have to figure out how they came up with all this stuff, right? And what, there's a physical reality to all of this. There were people taking part in the mysteries. There were people, taking part in the temple worship in Jerusalem. There were people taking part when they're with their tent in, in the desert um, and they're having the voice of God descend and boom out from between these angels' wings, right, to the, to the high priest, the anointed. There's a reason that they're, they're doing this. And I want to find out that concrete, you know, um, they didn't have any, they didn't have, mythicists running around right it was okay you can say they're humor that you um you you humorous right that he started all of this by saying ah oh, you know look they're they're probably kings and there are some kings in this list oh he just uh he just glitched out it's all right i'll be back all right uh in the meantime though i found something that's absolutely stunning i sure i just th- okay so um I, make sure I, you make sure you uh make it bigger though Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Here is this better? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. There you go. All right. So l- l- look at this. C- can you read this? You got your blue over. If you take the blue oh. off, I can probably. Uh, let me see if I can read it. It says, "Ash Ashmona Ashmonim Ashmonim." Yeah, a- Ashmanim. But um, again, this is you know. Uh, let's see. It says it's used in. Um, shoot. Does it? Oh, Isaiah fifty nine ten. Um. Let's look it up. Um, when he was in Isaiah? Yeah. No way. No way. You have found. Good call. I knew. I, that's why I know. That's why I would bring you on, dude. I'm looking. Oh, wow. Looking for- Holy crap. And it translates. Um, oh, wait. Hold on. Wait. Okay. We got to find this. This is going to be This is going to be big. This is, guys, this is live. We're, we're doing philology right here. Wow. It's- right, hold on. Where is it? What does it say about Eshmon in Isaiah? 
So it says um it says ba bash money. Yeah. Uh, um so so here it's saying um let's see Nick Shush. Um it says that says uh Nugisha. Nugisha. Uh, Nugisha. Um, um yeah, from Gashash, uh, which means to grope or feel with the hand, but um so it's saying we grope, um K um uh, okay, Ivrim. Um, this is interesting because um, Iver. This is like it. It sounds like it's a play on words of Avar, like like which is the root for Hebrew. But in this case, it means blind. So uh, we feel like the blind um, man along a wall. Uh, care, care is a wall, and um, among um, security, we are like the dead. Yeah, that's what's really striking. So it's saying um, it be ash, uh, bashmanim. Kame team and Kame team means like the dead, but it's saying among the sturdy. But here it's saying, what's this be? Um, meaning of Hebrew, uncertain. Emendation yields in the daytime among the sturdy, we are like the dead. So this is basically the best translation they have so far. And this is based off of the Masoretic tradition, which, you know, associates these vowels yeah, but, as being what it that, is. But that's not, that's not Eshmoni, that's Bashmoni. Well, no. So ba means in. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so, um, so where, so, so wait, what, why doesn't Ash, doesn't sh, the word shmun by itself, the, the shin, the m, the mem, and the nun means oil. But if you add an ah at the end, it means eight. Shmone. So how does, how do you, how does, how does it get the word stumble on there? Um, See that that that's what I'm not really certain about, but it's definitely something I'm going to look yeah. more into. Yeah, that's what, what, what's interesting though is if you click on this, the root it gives, which is interesting because usually you only have triconsonantal roots. The root it gives is a like qua, like it has four letters, which is not typical. So, um, I mean, it's it's clear that there's also because it relates it to the dead, the fact that Eshmun is a dying and rising god. Um, and then here it's also saying in the daytime and like daytime is understood as kind of like, the, like, like if night is death and day is, I mean, I, I, this might be a bit of a stretch, but yeah, I don't know, but yeah, there, there's not if a it had something to do with oil or eight, then I'd be interested. But if that's, that's just something else at this point, you know what I mean? Well, well so this is also interesting because that is why, uh, redress is far from us and vindication does not reach us. We hope for light and low, there is darkness for a gleam and we must walk in gloom. So it's like it it has a, oh wow we all growl like bears we moan like doves like yeah, but what, a lot. what my question is what is this tied to this one how does this tie to this one this is one word we're looking at well you know I mean? yeah but it's a word that has an uncertain origin and the thing is that so here it reads as ashmanim but the thing is that like um well, could, if it has unknown origin is this possible that there's an, that's a mistranslation then well th that that I mean, basically, because we don't know for certain, like, where this is coming from, this is the closest, like, it, it's not really a translation, right. it's, it's a guess. But you know what's funny is that, like the dead, if if that were, so if this was a mistranslation, wouldn't it oil like the dead, or like, um, bomb like the dead, wouldn't that sort of fit? I'm just saying. Yeah. Now, what if that's the case? What if we just crack this new translation that no one else figured out yet? But I doubt that. But I'm yeah, just saying, that, that actually would fit. We become embalmed like the dead, right? But yeah, I mean, it's definitely something to look into. But the other thing that I was uh, talking about, oh, shoot, where is it? Okay, here. Um, because it's really interesting because we we're talking about how you know the the creator of the world is actually the goddess. But so so uh, so here to start off. So you have Ashrei Adam. So so first of all, it has Ashrei, which means happy is the one. Uh, because Ashrei Adam, but that's the same root as asherah so happy is the man who finds wisdom and so it's important to understand here that oh, it's oh shit asherah is the wisdom yeah yeah i know um, i know where you're going with it that's a really good point asherah is always asherah is seen as like sophia basically and so what's interesting here so you have wisdom from chokhma but then you have tvuna which is from bina which is understanding um so like they're 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 correlated but they're both understood as being almost like Twins it's like a fun, or, basically. Yeah. But so then it goes to so it, it sometimes will get translated as its value, but really it, it's her value. So her value in trade is better than silver, her yield greater than gold. 
She is more precious than rubies. All of your goods cannot equal her. In her right hand is the length of days, in her left riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths peaceful. But here's where it gets interesting. She is a tree of life to all who grasp her, and whoever holds on to her is happy. But the very next thing, and this is part of the same, like, like even though it seems like it goes on to a new topic, it's still part of the same um, chapter. The Lord, uh, uh, okay, so yeah, the Lord in wisdom founded the earth um establishing the the heavens um with understanding by um and th then it says uh by his knowledge but here it's under you know you have to understand that the knowledge is still her so she is his it's being phrased that way but um by his knowledge the oh wow yeah the the depths burst apart and the skies distilled do and here this word yirafu um Oh, never mind. That's a different um, route than I was thinking. But there, there's this one route that kind of goes into the whole idea of Nyx or like almost it reminds me of a sacred union between. Um, so this one term RFL. Um, so it, um, it's a Hebrew word meaning fog. But interestingly, uh, and I don't I don't have any direct evidence for this, but it's something that I've been trying to look for. Um, that it might be a combination of the words, um, oh shoot, I'm blank, um, afel, which means like darkness, and then or, yeah, so like um, arafel might be or afel, which is light and dark, and light and dark together creates gloom. Wow. Nice, nice. In support, the Septuagint supports your take. Ariel, because um, it uses the instrumental dative. I looked it up while you were saying it. Um, Sophia, it uses the instrumental dative. So when when the creator creates, he does it by the instrument of Sophia, right? So she becomes the creator no, without without a doubt. It's check, it's there. Check yeah. this out too. So remember, we're talking about Yasion, him and Demeter have a son called Coribas who is like the father of these Coribantes, these dancing priests of Phrygia. And these are the free, these are the, uh, the priests who later after the death of Attis castrate themselves. So you have coming from this Yasios character, you have the whole priesthood of Attis as a descendant of this, of his line. This what is, by write? the way, the source for this is Diodorus of Sicily. I, this is in the video. Take a, wouldn't see? it be nice? Right wouldn't, here. It, wouldn't it be nice if we had an Orphic hymn just to wrap everything up tightly with a bow, Neil? Yeah, I, nice? I was actually, I was actually going to say, I don't know. I don't have nothing else to add after that. Cause that, that's a fuck. That's a mind bender right there. That if from we, the Iasios from Crete, you have the Addis religion. Like that's like, if I like, I don't understand mythicists today. They want to argue over what Paul meant when he said something, or oh, it's all really the the Greek is uh is means this, and they just want to they're arguing losing battles when they could be just pointing to like ancient gods that look like Jesus. I don't know, just for food for thought, mythicists out there. But go ahead. If only if only we had a an Orphic <laughs> hymn to Korobos. That we could, oh, well, wait a minute. We do have an Orphic hymn to Korobos. Let me read it to you. Do it up. I, I call upon the greatest king of eternal earth, blessed Korobos, warlike of forbidding countenance, nocturnal curis, war, uh, who saves from dreadful fear, Korobos, you assist the imagination and you wander in deserted places. Lord, many are the shapes of your twofold divinity. All right, we're trying to match it up to next. Twofold divinity and the murder of the twin brothers has stained you with blood. Following Deo's scheme, following Deo's scheme, you changed your holy form into the shape of a savage and dark dragon. dragon. Blessed, blessed one, hear our voices. Banish harsh anger and free from fantasies, fantasias, free from those projected images, right? A soul stunned my 
Ananke by, ne by necessity. So um, what is Korobos doing? He is literally following um, the, gnome, the Gnosis of Deo. The Gnosis of Deo, the All-Mother who brings the um, Venus, who brings that priestess into existence, the Aryan queen, right? Um, the magic, that's how the magic rites work. That's the Vril. You, you just stumbled on the Vril from Korobos. Nice. Yeah. Now, that's, I don't know. There's something going on there, and I'm going to have to dig more into this. I want to talk to scholars who have really went deep into Samothrace or Crete. I want to get, like, why is, and the reason why I'm saying that, not saying that like we're not capable of doing this, but what I'm saying is why is no one mentioning some of this stuff? You know what I mean? Like you would think this would be like everyone should know this stuff. Like you'd think this is like very pretty interesting that people would know about this kind of stuff, but they really don't. No one talks about Eshman. I never hear anyone talk about Eshman. And all of, for the last 200 years, there's like one scholar who's written about Eshman. And uh, this Yasion character, Yasios, two different ways to spell it. Nothing, almost nothing on this god. Not like what? What's the reason for that? I don't know. I'm gonna see if I can find somebody who's like did some work on it. But um, by the way, if anyone, I'm just gonna say this before we close out. But, uh, anyone, at, Errol, you want to add anything before what we said? Um. Oh it, yeah. Just do you think there's any connection between Yasion and Jason? I. I, I was wondering that it's myself. It's the same name. It's the same name. Yeah. It's all the it, same root. Jesus is built on the same root. It's because in, in the Argonautica myth, they have it. They there somebody tells the story of of the what is it? It's the it's, golden it's, fleece. Well, yeah, the golden fleece story. In the beginning of that myth, they they tell the story of Saturn giving up his only begotten son. Like they, they someone someone tells that story. So the, that that Argonautica myth was super important going back to what is it, fourth century BC, right? Right in the begin right after Alexander did his thing and Ptolemy was king. Is that when it's that's when it gets penned down, right? From from uh Apollonius of Rhodes. Is that who it is? Dude, dude, the the Argonautica was part of uh pre Homeric um epic. Oh, is it really? Yes, no, no, no. Oh, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of somebody who retold it. They retold it. That's what happened because um, Apple Apollodorus he retells the story, but that's not the that's not the original version. No, 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 no. It's a good one, but it's not the original. So does there's an Orphic Argonautica? Did you know that? We have fragments of it. We have parts of it, very short. Yeah, but that's a good question too. I'm gonna I'm, that's that's something to look into. Like, what's the connection between Jason, whose name means healer, and I even talked to Kyle Ruck about this, who's a mythicist. Kyle Ruck is a mythicist, and he said the same thing that I'm just discovering right now is this Jason character is basically the same name as Jesus. Like, I can't believe he said that. It's one of my videos on my channel. You can go find it. Look but, up but yeah, like, Kyle Ruck. What I'm thinking, though, be is so think about it. So, you know, he goes on this journey. I mean, given some of the stuff is a bit more, at least with that part, it's a bit more reminiscent of, for instance, like, uh, shoot, I'm blanking. Which story is it from Mesopotamia? Um, is it the uh, epic Damn. of... Or um, it, where they, where he goes looking for the uh, for the flower of life or, or the tr uh, uh, tree of life. Well, Tamu, yeah, I, I'm not sure if he looks for the tree of life, but Tamu's just like uh, Yasios and Addis and Eshman dies. He's an agricultural deity, and then his lover, in the case in this case it's Zanana or Ishtar, goes down and brings him back up. And yeah. as he as he comes up, the dead are resurrected with him. And it's even what's even crazier about that myth is she's down there for three days. On the third day, she rises back up with him. And I don't know. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot going so, on there. So I'm I'm actually talking about. I think it might be the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I'm 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 rusty on this. I, this was like a year ago that I learned about this. But basically, it's very like parallel to the story of like the the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and basically this idea that the snake steals the 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 plant of life from him when he's oh going. that's Ap epic of gilgamesh good, good, good. oh yeah so yeah. um yeah he gets it, the, he gets the tree that gives him immortal uh, it makes him immortal and as he takes a nap I, I think it's a snake i think you're right i think it's a snake that comes up and steals it but and then yeah he, and then oh. it ends with him it ends with him like like crying because 
Why can't I live forever? Relatable. But yeah. Yeah, but yeah, so um with with the golden fleece, it's guarded by a dragon and it, it hangs from a holy tree, right? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm you're talking to me. I'm sorry, I was reading the notes, but yeah, no, in the Grove of Mars, there is a golden fleece, which you Queen Eudosha tells us it's called gold because it's alchemical. And on it is written. We know it. Dr. Ruck wrote a book and uh about the Samothracian mysteries. And in it, he talks about this and how um, the fleece has the song of Medea written on it in ink that's used as a poison slash cult drug. And um, we have ancient sources that tell us that this is what this is what it is. It's not like a valuable gold covered thing, yeah. right? But it's hung in the tree that um, one of the dragons guards right one of those temple guardians i wrote a, a chapter for a toxicological text it's used at university oh. uh, by elsevier and uh, in that i talk about the cat the priesthoods of the dragon and the wolves the um, romans have a priesthood for that god for mars and there's tw only they only have 12 at a time oh, the sali sali they're called leaping priests and they only wear a shield and a buckler yeah. they're naked yeah. and they're there's 12 of them and they only they have to be between 12 and 15 years old. And then as soon as they pass that age, they get kicked out and they initiate a new one. There was only always 12 at one time. It's the weirdest thing ever. I, I encourage anyone to look up the Sally, the priesthood of the Mars. And weirdest if, thing ever. And it's based to, off it's based off the Argonautica myth. And if you want another cool, I think it's the coolest priesthood, is the Dianus of Nimi, who uh, Diana of Nimi. Any MI and what it's an Italian one where in order for one priest to succeed another, they have to kill the previous priest. That to me, that's the wow, that's crazy. That's, that's the real the, mysteries. That's the one where they celebrate around the lake that goes down into the underworld and you breathe the vapors. And anybody else, like they, they have these caves, and if anybody else gets caught in these caves, they die. Cows that wander in there die, but the priest can walk through it freely. With no Look problems. They can, spend, they can spend hours there. Look at this ancient Roman religion, the Sally, yeah. leaping priest of Mars, supposed to have been introduced by King Numa Pompilus. There were 12 patrician youths dressed as archaic warriors, embroidered tunic, breastplate, and short red cloak, sword. I've, I've seen another text where they only wear the shield and something else, but I guess there's different, different stuff. Sword and spiked headdress and it called an apex. They where charged. did they come from, Neil? Where did they come from? It says right there with the name Egeria. Who's that Egeria? The nymph. Yeah, she's she's the Sybil. She's the one who gave him the past, present, and future, Numa. Right? Wow. She she is that Aryan queen. Oh, right? that's right. That's so, right. Yeah. Don't that's, you want to shouldn't we try to remake this thing? Who volunteers out there? Someone in your comments, you, got, you said if there's anything I want to say. Yeah. Someone they were, let me just finish this off, though. They were right. charged with 12 bronze shields called the Ankala. It looks like that. And which the Mycenaean shield. So they're going back to the Mycenaeans. Resemble a figure eight. <laughs> One of the shields was said to have fallen from heaven in the reign of King Numa. And 11 copies were made to protect the identity of the sacred shield on the advice of the nymph Igra. Now... That's crazy. There's only has to be 12. And I wonder how they, um, by the decree of Senate, Senate Augustus name was inserted in the song. Oh, wow. Ovid relates. Oh yeah. That's where I've heard this. That's where I knew about this because of Ovid's Ovid's Fosti. Yep. Yeah. I wonder how they chose the new, the new, and like when the person, when the other one, one of them got too old because it had to be a young boy. I wonder when they chose the new, how they chose a new one. You know what I mean? What do you guys think? If I remember correctly, I think one of the features that we're looking for were like beautiful men. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Interpretation of the miracles. Sally's rituals throughout the month of March from when the ancient authors and facts can reconstruct it. Hmm. Is there a, com uh, is there a connection between Mars and March? Yeah. That's where the, Mar that's where the name March yeah. is from. Mars. Right. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And now, Go ahead. And one of your people asked in the sideline, because I hate to ignore these excellent questions yeah. that are coming from the chat. One of them asked about Medea and monoclonal antibodies. 
So, and the only reason I'll mention that is, look, you know, we can talk about the theory and we can talk about, yeah, this probably came from here and that probably came from there, but the science is irrefutable. You don't have to make any theories from the science. You can just tell, tell your people what the data presents. And if you don't see the very base biochemistry that's going on here, then you're missing the fact that these are actual rites and rituals. When we're talking about these gods, they didn't sit around and study mythology. They had temples where they practiced their mythology. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, Look at this. I feel like I would, the person who wrote that, if I could pay for you to be transported back in time and to be thrown into the cave of Trophonius, where you would undergo the death resurrection rite, I would be, uh, um, you and I would be friends. We could have a, a drink together and life would be good. Um, let's this. start this, Neil. Let's let's restart this mystery. You found the name. You found the well, name. I just wanted to show you something real quick. Religious system is unclear. She is consistently, though, not in a very clear way, associated with Diana. Remember Diana? We're talking about Diana. Is uh, She's known as to be like the goddess of like wisdom and she's sort of a well she's artemis basically artemis she's the huntress you know what i mean yeah they called medea diana did you know that as she would i think it's past and, and the diodorus of sicily says that the persians worshipped her and call and he calls her the persian diana so this is like you get perseus medea diana she is the destroyer. She is the destroyer. That's what Percy paired in, in Greek means is the destroyer. So oh. um, remember, she's the hunter, huntress, right? right? She is the Diwanax, Wanasa. It's Mycenaean, the god Wanasa, the god queen. And she's presented in the Orphic hymns. I was just studying this with one of my students who does Norse. She's trying to compare the, the Norse with the Greek. Uh, predecessors say where's what's coming from what and um he just freezed out again he always does that uh according to mythology she counseled and guided king numa newman descended to express the will of the deity in the establishment of the original framework of laws and rituals of rome numa is repeated to be have written down the teachings of agiria in sacred books that he had buried with him. I wonder if that's the same thing as the uh, Vestal Vestal books, the um, the Sibylino. That's what he just said, actually. That's what Amon just said there. It's the Sibyl. That makes sense. Also, I wonder if there's like this parallel with, um, so you have, you know, Eshmoon and Astarte or, um, um, you know, Addison, Sibylle. But um, with Diana or uh, with Artemis, you have, was it Artemis and Orion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Orion, yeah, Orion, Orion, he dies and becomes a constellation. And uh, was it? Isn't he, his fight is against the scorpion? Yeah, actually, in fact, Artemis has a lot to do with the um, the, 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 the raising of the dead from Asclepius. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, Neil, that's perfect. In the Orphic hymn to Artemis, you have her putting the woman into the state of being able to deliver into this death to life state, resurrecting from this death state, the life. She is the bringer. They call her Iokeira, Iokeira, which is the, the literally it's the poison pourer, specifically the viper poison pourer. Well, Ooh, and, and, in, the, in the Eshman story, he's a hunt. He's a young hunter. And um, another thing is with Addis. No, no, I'm sorry. Adonis. Adonis and, and Venus, it's from Ovid's Metamorphosis, where they say that Adonis was warned by Venus, who loved Adonis. Don't go and hunt. You don't need to hunt. You're going to die if you go hunting. And as soon as she leaves, she's not even five feet away. He pulls out his bow and goes hunting, and then he gets killed by a boar. And then she comes back down, and she cries, and the her tears and his blood make like a, a resurrection rose or whatever. But anyways, Orion's also a hunter, too. So you got that thing going. But then I noticed something about the myth of Artemis. And Artemis is in love with Hi Hippolytus, the same name as the Christian. And he is in a chariot, racing as fast as he can, trying to be trying to impress her. And he falls off the chariot and dies, gets mangled up. He's dead. He's gone. And here you come walking Asclepius, you know, this holy bearded 
healer man it looks just like jesus it looks just like serapis and artemis is like asclepius please please bring him back to life and he's like i can't do that that's a zeus told me i could actually i have the power to do it but zeus told me that i cannot heal the dead that is a no no and she begs him please and he's like all right fine i'll do it he brings him back to life and a lot of people point this out it's like very similar to the to the scene of uh, Lazarus being raised up by Jesus. Jesus doesn't want to do it at first. He's like, no, 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 I don't want to, that's not, that's Yahweh. When you, when someone's die, they die. That's that's Yahweh's decree. He doesn't say it just like that, but you, know, you can infer that. Of course. He, actually, he ends up doing it because the, the, the mother is crying. There's a lot of similarity going on there. He raises up Lazarus. Asclepius raises up Hippolytus, and Zeus is angry with that. But anyways, I'm just pointing that out there. It's like there's a lot of healing, rising, that like stuff like that. The coolest part of that story, in my opinion, is the fact that Hippolytus gets dragged to death um, by his chariot because of Aphrodite. He walked past the statue of Aphrodite, and because he worshipped Artemis the Virgin or Diana the Virgin, he said some nasty comment about the statue of Aphrodite and said, I'd never, I'd never honor that god, right? And so she sent, she sent his destruction right that's yeah. the beauty of that story not the resurrection not the it's the fact that he got killed because he was so darn disrespectful you yeah know what i mean i no, think so. no i get that that's a good point um but you know what I, I just thought of something i just remember that somebody who super chatted last time and his name was canaan i hope if you're watching i hope i just remember that i'm supposed to address your super chat in this video i don't know so i should have did it early on but i just remembered now but before we get to that one, while I'm looking for a super chat, can some can one of you answer this one? It's from Paul Kickling. Thank you for the super chat, man. I really appreciate it. Super chats is what helps me keep this channel alive. So if you guys want to help support, please, I really appreciate these super chats. And uh, thank you, Paul. Oil preserves anything submerged in it, i.e. eternal life. Tree of life gives Im immortality. Be Christ-like, you will get immortality. Interesting. Now, it's funny because the embalming aspect, the the Osiris mysteries, has a lot to do with oil, too. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I'm going to jump in with Christos. does mean to have oil applied to oneself, right? Um, but it means that it's based to be stung by the gadfly, by the oysters. And since the oysters is connected with the birthing cult and Diana, I would say linguistically we have the strongest connection that the Christ is the one who is enters the state of oystermania. That's the state that the Sibyls prophesied in, oystermania, they called it. And so is there an association with Christ in this whole cult of this great virgin queen? Yeah, there is. There is, right? Why do you think his mother has to be that figure, right? Because that's what the Magi told him, right? <laughs> do, you see yeah. the, do you see the circle in this, right? He was programmed from birth, right? According to the story, you know, he was programmed from birth for this <laughs> specific right. So that's that's where that's where I stand. How about you, Ariel? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's interesting from a like kind of like a metaphysical perspective. Like, you know, all the way back in antiquity, people were you know aware because you know when when they preserved stuff in oil, how it would keep better because you know it wasn't exposed to the elements, but. I mean, I, I don't really know anything beyond just like that connection that's, you know, made between the idea of like Christ as like, you know, eternal and then the idea of oil as a good preservative. But um, kind of going on the idea of like uh, Diana and like the um, I, I forget exactly what, what it was you said, but like the connection with the birthing process. But do you think there's a connection with Vaticanos? Uh, um, yeah, I think there is Sp only because. Um, we've got prophetesses who are coming through the worship of Vaticanus. So, yeah, I think it. Um, when we have the uh, uh, Etruscan Sybil step up, when we have her um, literally, and you get this image of the boy, right, coming out of the ground, it gives the, everybody's like shocked and like, what the? And, <laughs> and you get Vagoya then transmitting the mysteries um, uh, through her own teaching, I, I'd say you can't, you cannot say that that Vaticanus was worshiped on the hill, right? And he's this old pre-Italic God, 
So yeah, if he's oracular and he's producing sibyls, just like the Babylonian side, then hey, um, we're at the same party. We're all using the same drugs at the same party, right? Yeah. Now this is from last time. I missed this one. I really feel bad about it. I did not mean to miss it. Um, I had it on the screen for like five minutes, and then we went to. The, I skipped to the next one, thinking that I already answered it, but we didn't even read it yet. It was just on the screen. So Canaanite, I apologize. I'm reading it now. And he says, as the Can as the last Canaanite left, <laughs> I say this is true. So would you say my gods are the father of all Abrahamic religions? Ooh, ooh, interesting. I would say, yeah, the Canaanite religion is the original Israelite religion. I, I'd say. What do you think, Ariel? So I'd say they exist in the same paradigm, except um, like Judaism is like it tries fundamentally to be a like a moral revolution from those previous things so like a good example would be the flood in you know in ancient canaan it had a lot to do with the gods being annoyed um similar to mesopotamia but the reason that's given in the um in the hebrew bible is that it was because humans were being immoral and so if you look at it just within that context or um outside of any ancient context you see okay so god sends a flood that's pretty screwed up. You know, why didn't he just make humans to be better? But at the end of the day, they're they're trying to morally revolutionize these myths that already existed. And um, so, like, I think that in a way, but not completely. So, like, yeah, half. yeah, I get what you're saying, because you, you can't not. Yeah, they're different. They're different. But you can obviously see the language is there. The, the name of the gods are there. Stuff like that. So, yeah, I would I, I agree with you on that. I would say if I can answer it for sure. the last Canaanite, which I hope you can find a suitable Canaanite wife, maybe it'd not be the last one, but um, the uh, I was at Tel Megiddo digging with the Chicago team uh, and Solomon's Solomon's complex there is so, Neil, you're going to see it in a month, you know, in a few weeks. Solomon's complex there is so impressive. And it's just, oh God, it's overwhelming. You just get this feeling for that power going there too. That, that his kingdom had, that power that they had. And um, as, as you walk down to the bottom of the complex, um, you get to an area where the Canaanite temple is. And that is below everything else. Yet, oh, it, wow. is, it is of a similar, if not more impressive, refinement. And I only say more impressive because it's so much earlier. Wow. Um, they they were I, dating it. Now they may have changed. They their built name. Solomon's temple on top of the Canaanite. Uh, on top of a Canaanite temple, and oh, now, now they were dating it. When I was working with, um, they were dating it to about four thousand. Somewhere they thought between four thousand five hundred and four thousand was what they were projecting. And just even if they were close to that, even even if it was anywhere in the neighborhood. You cannot help but step back last Canaanite and say, oh, my God, this is the mother of all my of all my religion sitting right here. I mean, it, it just wow. I, I mm. love it. Yeah, it's like, are we supposed to believe that Solomon was, you know, this wise king who was granted wisdom by, you know, Yahweh? And all of a sudden he just goes off and is worshiping all of these. Yeah, he's still off the deep end. Yeah. 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 Like, like in the Septuagint, he's, he's got satyrs on the wall. On this pl a big plaque of like, of like a, a zodiac with satyrs on it, with like, you know who the satyrs are. But yeah, like the the idea that the goddesses that he was worshiping that it was because of his wives. It's like seriously, like you're saying that the king of uh, you, you know this wise and powerful king that he's so wise, but he's you know he's like such a pushover that he does whatever his wives tell him just because they tell like, I'm sorry, I don't buy that. That's the only way that the yeah. uh, Hebrew Bible can present him as, you know, like that he fell victim to this stuff because I know why uh, they do that. I don't know why they do that. They do it to distance themselves from the past. That is the real past of the Israelites. And they, for some reason they, they, they moved out of that sort of mentality that those, those pa pagan mentality into a different mentality and they're like no that wasn't us that was because he you know he did that all that wrong stuff but really that was the norm that's what i think it was the norm during that time that's what i think your your super chatter says did a ha have a boy 
I just wanted to point out he had a daughter, Neil. He had several daughters, right? Hygieia is one of them. But he had several daughters, and one of them is named Iaso. <laughs> well, yeah, I remember that now. Iaso. Iaso. Here, I'll pull it. Like Iaso. Like Iaso. Yeah, yeah. That, that word means heal, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. So, Asclepius is very similar to like something like a Christ. Like he's very, he's a healer, a savior. He's very all, he's all those things. He's and a great this is, physician, this is his bro. Daughter. He's his daughter is Yasso. Oh, Yasso, wow. Daughter of Asclepius. She had four sisters Kesso, Aglia, Hygia, Pankia, or Panakia. Panacea, yeah. Panacea. Panacea, good. And uh, wow. Wait, what did she do with Pan? The fifth is dedicated to the nymphs of Pan. So, pa oh, my Paus Pausanias is one of my favorite writers ever. You got to read his stuff. I've been, I go back to it all the time. This is what he said. He gives you the he gives you the best information. He's priceless, but this is what he says. The altar shows parts. One part is Heracles, Zeus, and Apollo Healer. Oh wow, Apollo Healer. I wonder what that is. Another is given up to the heroes and the wives of heroes. The third to Hestia and Hermes, Amphiaris, and the children of Amphilochus. But Alcmaon, because his treatment of Eriphile is honored neither in the temple of Amphiaris nor yet Amphilochus. The fourth portion of the altar to Aphrodite and Panacea and further to Iaso, Hygieia, and Athena healer. The fifth is dedicated to the nymphs and to Pan. Yes, you gotta love Pan. And the rivers, Achilles and Cephasus. Wow. So that's like a yeah, healer. healing that must be cult. Like a heal yeah, that's a healing cult. That's what that is. And you know what they do at those places? They sleep in overnight. They had the sick people come in there. They call. They call. This is. I, I've heard. I'm not sure if this is true or not. You might know this. I've heard the word sleep comes from this because they would sleep in overnight at Asclepius's. They Incub would sleep. Incubations. They call them incubations, and it wasn't just temple medicine. Um, doctors had incubations as well and talk about the, the efficacy of incubations. So, yeah, incubo, to recline, right, to lay down. That's what I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say yeah. sleep. I meant to say incubate. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why it's says sleep. Because yeah. that's what they would do. They would lay – yeah, that's what I, – I, I don't know. I butchered that one. And I mean, that's what I meant. Sleep, a sleep. I don't yeah, know. I don't know why I said that. I don't know what – I don't even know where that came from. The interest – oh, I was just going to say – But that's why word. I have Amon here to correct my Greek when I butcher it. I wonder if there might be a connection between Yaso and the the uh, Semitic root Yasha or Yasa, um, because obviously there's you know everyone has the idea of like um, th that so so you know Yeshua or like Yehoshua, but what um not, it doesn't only mean deliver. And I'm actually sharing the screen right now, but um, deliver a rescue, but also safety or welfare. Wow. Mm. Oh, is this what you have right here or no? Uh, Neil, oh, yeah. Neil, we got to we got to keep things on the straight up. Incubation is from the Latin. Incubo is from the Latin, but that's because the Asclepian cult becomes Latinized, right? Right. Under Asclepius, yeah, because so, he's Ophiuchus in Greek. Yeah. So the sleep, hang on, the sleep is hypnos, and you do have a hypnagogue, right? You have drugs that lead you into sleep. They call them hypnagogues. And you can administer these before an incubation. But I just didn't want to give your audience the wrong impression. Yeah, Incub yeah, yeah. Incubation is Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sleep, yeah, okay. Paul Kickling, Iasion, I-O, Zion. <laughs> Input, output, Zion, i.e. communication with God via wave function signals. You input logos into God, and he input logos into you. And it's whether it's fallen, corrupted code or golden code. I don't know what you just said there, but it sounds pretty fucking dope, man. Why don't you give me some of that ayahuasca you got over there, bro? I, I was gonna say, Paul, get some pass, of that the, ayahuasca. <laughs> pass the ayahuasca. You're getting you're getting into the quantum physics. He's, of all he, this. he's got the mysteries, Paul. Paul Kickling's got the mystery. He's over mm -hmm. in Eleusis right now, on top of the mountain. Yeah, he's, he's got the the Pythia right in front of him. Yeah, yeah, he's inhaling all the toxins and all that. He's, he's you could tell, you could tell he's over there. 
He, if but, he were living in antiquity, he'd be hanging out with the Magus, right? Oh, he'd be seventh seventh degree initiate. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> if you figure it out, Paul, figure out the physics and break it down for us so that we can analyze it and and maybe replicate it. You can be like the. I'll invite you to the secret meetings that we have later. From everything I've heard, though, it really seems like the name Zion or Zion is just a way of trying to reclaim the idea of the mountain of the god, Mount Safon, but changing the 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 pay or the fe into a um, into a yud, so it becomes from, uh, Zion from Safon. Yeah, and it, the main reason for that was because Safon was the mountain of Baal. Wow. Is that right? It was a mountain of Baal. Yeah, that that was where um, Baal's temple was built. But mm -hmm. the temple of Yahweh was built on Heart Zion, on Mount Zion. Baal, mm -hmm. Baal is a dying cool. and rising god too. In a, cool. In a way. This in stuff is so cool. Yeah, it is. Um, I don't know. I don't really got anything else to add. That was the last super chat as of right now. Unless anyone squeezes one in real quick, but I don't know. I have. I do want to mention this though. I am busting my behind over here. And if you guys enjoy this stuff, please consider my Patreon. You could drop like three bucks or something a month. However, if you join today, you will not get charged until November 1st. So you get a whole free month. And that also includes when I go to Israel and the, from the 20th till the 1st of next month, you'll get access to all the exclusive content that i'm getting only from our patreon members if you are a member on youtube i can give you a link to see the israel content you just gotta you gotta email me and tell me show me which tell me which member you are also if you donated on the, on the gofundme for for the trip and you're not a patreon member you do the same thing email me tell me when you don't donate it because i could you could, it's on the there's a whole list of the names and times and I'll give you the link as well. But as far as everyone else, join the Patreon, please. It helps me uh, continue this channel. And uh, I'm putting out content every day for the most part. Sometimes I have one day off. But I'm trying to put out content every single day. And if you guys like this, enjoy it. If you want to support, please uh, try out one of those three ways of uh, – or two ways, I guess. Join the channel on here on, on YouTube or the Patreon. Neil, are you going to tell – me and your and Ariel and your audience, what you're going to be doing while you're in Israel? Will you be filming yes. in order that you can have additional content? Can you just ten, tell us what? That ten is? days, no breaks, nonstop filming stuff, going to different spots. We're going everywhere from the Galilee down to the desert near Qumran and near the Sinai, whatever desert is. We're checking out at all the hot spots, all the big locations where John the Baptist's tomb, uh, Mount Mount Masada. On top of Masada, we're going to look at all the skeletons and stuff. We're going to check out underground where where uh, King Hezekiah, you know, had that tunnel. We're going all the spots. We're going to be on the shores of Galilee going live. And you guys can drop super chats, ask me and Dr. Tavor and Derek Lambert questions. And um, oh, and another thing, if you do join my Patreon, you can all, you have direct contact with me. There's a messenger uh, option in the Patreon. You can talk to me anytime. I'll respond. Ask, ask the other Patreon members. They're, they, I respond. I'm not just idle on there. It might take me six hours or a day, but I will respond. So you guys, if you want to join my Patreon, you have direct contact with me, all that stuff. You can give me ideas of who I should bring on, different scholars. You can give me ideas of topics. All that stuff, I really welcome all that stuff. And uh, you now that's enough pr uh, promoting for me. Amo has a channel as well. Links in the description. You want to talk about your channel? Yeah, Neil's going to be helping me. So, and uh, I've got two com coming out that will come out. I'm working with another person, more PBS-ish. I want to kind of get like a short 10-minute deal of some background. And Neil's going to help me with the stuff that's too hot to handle because he's, yeah. you know, he's got the stuff that, you know, um, for example, uh, we want to be talking about Petronius' Satyricon. We want to be talking about drugs. And we, we want to be talking about um, what they're using the dildos for in the Satyricon and what the Satyrian is, what kind of drug it is. 
So yeah, but I got you know Neil's busy, so we'll get. I'm getting something. I'm getting something, Neil. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, yeah. Uh, check out Lady Babylon. The links in the description. And and then Ariel, I think I you said you might be starting your own channel. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I already have a channel set up. I just don't have anything on it yet. So next time we come on here, why don't you give me the link for that channel? And I can I'll get people. At least we can get you some subscribers before you even put a video up, just like we have with Amor. So oh, yeah. If you want to tell them, I mean, you can even put the link in the description. I can, if you have it, if you want uh, to do it. Yeah, I'll do that now. Um, I'm right. probably going to start with some, like, text studies or something. Maybe bring, um, like. Uh, put it in I, the private chat, and then I'll put it in the chat. Uh, cool. Yeah, um, but one thing that I'm really interested in, so um, I think I told you about this, but I was actually um, corresponding with this one YouTuber, Milkmaid's Honey. Uh, she She's a member of the LDS Church, but. She's done a lot of uh, research into like the connection between the Mormon conception of Heavenly Mother and the figure of Asherah in ancient Israel. And it's so fascinating. Like, I I had no clue that the Mormon church was so interested. I mean, obviously not everyone, but like just that it's something that, you know, most Christians won't even touch because of it being seen as heretical, but it's not according to, you know, the LDS church. They get naked for initiation. I have, I've been communicating one of my students. Um, was, yeah. has talked about initiation a little bit and they get naked and go through the Genesis run. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good stuff. I wonder if they, if they incorporated drugs early on, if they, you know, how it would have changed the, never yeah. mind. Well, that's going to be it for now. There's no more super chats. Oh, so. and I, I sent the link in the, yeah, I dropped it in there. I dropped it in there. Okay, cool. So yeah, that link, uh, that chat, that, that last uh, message for me is Ariel's uh, channel. So check that out. Hit the subscribe button and you'll see some content coming on the, on, down the road. And uh, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.